Today's sermon is Jesus says, game on. Jesus says, game on. And I'm going to begin with a key passage of scripture that I just decided to include at the beginning. It's, it's one of our navigation guidance points from God's word. It's not on the screen, but if you have a Bible or can use a pew Bible, you can open it up and read it with me. It's from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 25. This verse follows after earlier in what we read is Isaiah chapter 49, what would be called the second of the four servant songs that space out in Isaiah chapters 40 through 53. This is a servant about the one who is anointed and called by God in the spirit. And then now, what is God up to? Isaiah 49, verse 25. For thus says the Lord, even the captives, you need to pay attention to that, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant shall be rescued. For I will, the Lord himself says this, I, I myself, I will contend with those who contend with you, my people. And I will save your children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. I don't know if you're a wildlife person. I know we got a lot of folks in here who are hunters, so most of y'all are going to know this. An eagle typically does not fight a snake on the ground, right? What does an eagle do? The typical tactic of an eagle is the eagle snatches up the snake from the ground and carries the snake high up into the skies. You understand what's happening here, right? The eagle changes the battleground. The eagle is going to take the snake from the snake's home turf on the dirt or on the rocks and take the snake up into the air. That is not the snake's home turf. The snake is not equipped to fight up in the air. So the eagle changes the battleground from the dirt or the rocks to the heavens. And then what happens often, you've probably seen this before if you're out around in the wildlife some, you'll see that sometimes a hawk or an eagle will drop a snake. And the snake will be slithering, you know, fall into the ground, freaking out, you know, fighting against the wind it is not prepared to fight against, wearing itself out. And then the eagle will swoop down, or the hawk will swoop down and catch the snake again right before it hits the ground, or maybe even let it hit the ground, and then pick it up again. The snake is disoriented. The snake is out of strength. Its power and its insight is stripped away from the snake. Disoriented and spent, the snake is weak and vulnerable, unlike it was on the ground, where just a few minutes before it was powerful, wise, and deadly. So given all that and understanding the way that fight's going to work, why would an eagle ever fight a snake down on the ground? Because this just looks like a different situation than what I was talking about earlier, right? I'm still, I'm still going to go with the hawk or the eagle, but, you know, it's a little bit more touch and go now, right? Down on the ground. Why? Why wouldn't the eagle go ahead and snatch up the snake and take it? To, why didn't he surprise the snake? Well, you know, sometimes there may be a situation where maybe something that belongs to the eagle is on the verge of being killed by the snake. And we're down to a situation where it's do or die, and the eagle's gonna have to come, maybe to save a chick, right? 
because the chick is going to die a few seconds from now if the eagle does not go ahead and divert the snake into direct conflict and conquer the snake on the snake's home turf. Now that's a much more dangerous but more magnificent situation even than what I described at the beginning. That's what we're talking about, of course, when we talk about the ministry and the mission of Jesus. We've been talking about his mission in a general sense as we move through the Gospel of Luke, but most definitely last Sunday, today, and next Sunday as we come to this just magnificent passage of Scripture where I've been parking. As the French would say, je me garde ici. I'm, I'm parking here, you know. I'm, I'm hanging out here at Luke 11, 14 through 23. And we've been looking at this passage combined with other passages throughout uh, the Gospel of Luke, confronting us with the reality, the height, the depth, the gravity of Jesus' mission for us. And his total, I mean absolutely total, understanding of what he was doing and what's at stake. You don't have to go to the Gospel of John to get that Jesus totally understands what is happening and what he is doing. Now last Sunday, in our initial reflection bridging into this passage, in my sermon, Devil's Defeat, Undivided Love, and if you missed that sermon, you really need to go back to that one. That's the one that was recorded on July the 28th. Uh, devil's Defeat, Undivided Love, because that really laid out the template for what we're looking at and the mission of Jesus. One of the key scriptures to which we turned was, of course, 1 John 3, verse 8. And the second part of that tells us what Jesus was doing, why he came, in short order. I mean, yes, he came because God so loved the world. Yes, but what's going on with all this? Well, the same writer who, of course, wrote John's Gospel, chapter 3, tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose. How's he going to save us? What's the impact of his love? Where's this headed? What's the direction? The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And the works of the devil implicate not only your soul and your eternity, but also all creation. Jesus is coming as the redeemer of all creation, as well as at the heart and center of that, your savior, the savior of people made in God's image. So we have basically here, very simply as the scripture puts it, a battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And light is coming into darkness. Light is gonna come down into darkness. And we talked last week, of course, about the snake. I told you about the proto-evangelium. Genesis 3, verse 15, as the template for basically what runs from Genesis 3 all the way through Revelation chapter 22. And we dealt with the snake, the snake in the garden, who is identified, of course, later, if we, in case we miss this, in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 20 as that ancient serpent, Satan, or the devil. So the snake in the garden all the way through Revelation. Now, we are, let me just pull off and say, you know, we're talking about somebody who's named a whole lot of different names. The snake or the serpent, that ancient serpent. Hasatan, Satan. Diabolus, the devil. This is just in the Greek New Testament. And Lucifer. Same, same person in different kind of forms or presentations or titles. Originally created as a holy archangel but rebelled against God, the supreme God. So what do some of these names mean? Well, Hasatan means the enemy or specifically the accuser. Because that's his job. He really wants to accuse people made in God's image and undermine the whole program. Remember I talked about this last week. Go back to last week. When he goes after you, he's really ultimately going against God because you were originally made in God's image and he's after God. Um, the devil, Diabolus the slanderer, the one who lies and twists things, okay, both in getting to us and then in accusing us. And a term that's going to be introduced today in the scripture, we read it last week, Beelzebul. Now, in Matthew, I think it's Beelzebub, um, and, and that means it kind of got developed into this understanding of the Jewish people of the Lord of the Flies, okay? But here it's Beelzebul, 
And in the Hebrew Old Testament, Zabol, okay, is used five times. It means like a dwelling place or a dynasty. And so it's not by accident that this term gets used into this conversation today because we're talking about Satan as being the master, the Baal, the master of a dynasty or a house. And Jesus is going to talk about what happens with that house. But who is the devil at the end of the day? Who is Satan? Who's Beelzebul? Well, Jesus himself tells us this. We read it in John chapter 12, verse 31. He is the ruler of this world. This is his turf right now. Now, Jesus says that. He's in charge right now. And Paul doubles down on this by saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that Satan is the god of this age. So you see, when Satan tempts Jesus with all the authority over all the kingdoms and nations of the world, it's a serious temptation. This is not a, a bogus temptation. Jesus would not have, have gone through the temptation unless it were. Satan is in charge of all the present political systems. That's what he's telling Jesus, and Jesus doesn't dispute him on that. Jesus just rejects the temptation. By the way, if you're really into politics, you're probably bumping in bed with Satan quite a bit. Just be honest. I mean, that's according to the Bible. The Bible says that these present nations are a drop in the bucket. If your trust is in the, the former Soviet Union or present-day Russia or the United States of America or Great Britain, you are cruising for a bruising in eternity, according to the Bible. So he's the ruler of this age. He's, he's the god of this age. He's the He's in charge of this world and all its nations. So why fight him on the ground? Why come to ground and say game on down here? Why? Well, we've already dealt with that. We got some children who are in serious trouble. And God is going to redeem his creation. He's going to redeem the ground, actually. He's going to bring light to darkness. And he's going to save his people. Okay, so he's going to come down to the ground, but why does he come as he comes? Because let's go to the next slide. The Son of God appeared how? As the mightiest eagle in the sky? No, he comes as a vulnerable little baby. That's the way Luke chapters 1 and 2 start out for us, right? So here we're dealing with the mystery and the majesty of God's undivided love for you. Because to redeem us and to redeem us fully... This is the way he comes, stripping himself of all his prerogatives so that he might redeem the least and the last and the lost of us. I mean, this is undivided love. Again, we talked about this last week, but just remember, he's coming to redeem creation and at the heart of his saving purposes to redeem a people that were made originally for communion and dominion with God on earth in the creation. The son is committed in love to the father's plan. Satan hates the plan, and he's going to take all the people in the image out. But the son is not going to let it happen. And he comes as one of us and begins like that for the fight. It's incredible. Now, when Jesus teaches us then to pray, your kingdom come, I want to tell you, we ought to be trembling when we say those words. We ought to understand that this is everything. Well, yeah, I kind of say that ritualistically, you know, before I'm, while I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for lunch, I say, thy kingdom come. No, 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 my friend. This is a huge prayer because this implicates everything I've just talked about. Your kingdom come. Where? Not in heaven. We're good there down on the dirt with the snake. In creation, your kingdom come. Here. Among other places in the United States of America, anybody for that? Existing kingdoms. We have a conflict going on with existing kingdoms. Your kingdom come means we got other people in power and other nations. They're ahead in the wrong way. We, gotta, like, we, get, we need a serious reversal here. Existing kingdoms in the world and in creation. 
I've laid out some scripture for you, talked about that last week some, you can go to those sites. And remember, with the Proto-Evangelium, Jesus is born of woman, right? He's the seed of woman, just like God prophesied to the snake in Genesis 3.15, and we get Paul doubling down on that by citing the early Christian creed. It's clearly an early Christian affirmation from the first century Christians. I mean, first generation Christians. What does he say? In the fullness of time, this is Galatians 4.4, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, how? Born of woman, dot, dot, Genesis 3.15 born of woman there we got it that's what the, that's what that's game on to fulfill his saving mission and that is to crush satan's reign and to eliminate all satan's works which will bring about the possibility of a new heaven and a new earth destroy the works of the devil so i have good news for you light will prevail over darkness if you're concerned about that, if it looks like it's getting really dark, I got, got really good news for you. Light will prevail. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And Jesus says, he guarantees us, as the outcome is sure. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. That's the devil. But when strong, one stronger than him, he attacks him, this is Jesus now, and overcomes him. He, the stronger one, takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. There's your Isaiah 49, 25. You see it? Same thing. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the servant. I've come. Here it is. And he will crush Satan's rule. So now let's turn to our scripture points of reference for today further from Luke's gospel. When Jesus says, game on. Luke 4, 17 through 21, Jesus, after defeating the devil in round one, in the duel in the desert, Jesus is up ministering in the Galilee, and he comes to his hometown to preach, to be there, to worship, and they give him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Luke 4, 17 through 21, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given him. He unrolled the scroll and found, this is Jesus now, he's in his hometown synagogue, and found the place where it is written. So it's Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty. In the Greek, aphasis. It's picking up on the Septuagint Old Testament off of all these Isaiah texts. He has sent me to proclaim aphasis, liberty, to the captives. What do you mean captives? To whom are they captive? Okay, if you've been listening in the last five minutes, you know the answer to that question. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Yes, they're captive to sin, but sin is just a device that Satan uses to further ensnare us, okay? And recovery of sight to the blind, to send out the oppressed in a faces in liberty, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Game on. I am here. And you know what I'm doing. Now, apparently Satan in the demonic realm is really freaking out about this because all of a sudden during Jesus' early ministry you get people all these demon possessed people emerging like in the path of Jesus ever notice that it's kind of interesting like we're, it's like oh but he, hey he's down on the satan's turf luke 4 31 through 36 and before i read this let me ask you how many demonic deliverances are there in the old testament how, how many times does elijah for instance one of the most powerful of the prophets, deliver people from demonic possession. How many times? How many times do you see that in the Old Testament? The answer is none. None. Again, you have to understand, Jesus with his actions is saying, game on, it's here. Everything that was prophesied, it's now with me. You didn't see it in the Old Testament? I'm bringing it now. Luke 4, 31 through 36. Then he came to 
down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching. The Greek there is didache, it's like instruction of way of life. Because his word was with authority, exousia. He's got, he doesn't just have power, he has the actual authority. He is divine. And in the synagogue was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Now, you notice this is one demon. This is a single demon, and he's talking about plural here. What have you to do with us? Now, at one level, you could read this, and this may be part of the case. He's talking about the man he possesses as well as himself. But at another level, based on what we just learned and read, we're talking about the whole demonic realm. A single demon is saying, what are you doing with us? Why are you on our turf? All of us demons. All of us of the realm, okay? <laughs> what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? There it is again, us. And 1 John 3, 8 says, yep. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And to a demon, this is like a curse word. The Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. Jesus is commanding demons. And when the demon had thrown the man down in the midst, he came out from him having done him no harm. Then amazement came upon all. And they were saying to one another, what word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And now again to our main passage during this little segment of Sundays. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And remember, apparently the demon is mute because Satan has disfigured the demon to then be reflected in the disfigurement of people. Okay, so apparently, and notice that this demon doesn't talk to Jesus. This demon is mute, apparently. It, the, Luke is not confused here. The demon is mute and the man is mute. Because Satan really wants to deconstruct the image of God. Um, he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. This may be the first time in years this guy spoke. Maybe the first time in all his life this man has spoken. I mean, this is an incredible miracle here. Wouldn't you be impressed and fall on your knees before Jesus and say, what do you need, boss? Right? Let's see what happens. The people marveled. Now, in case you haven't figured this out yet, I've talked about it a bunch of times in Luke. Marveling at Jesus and applauding is not saving faith. Being impressed is not saving faith. You had all these people marveling at Jesus. A lot of them aren't going to be believers, okay, for real. Anyway, they're marveling, but some of them said, and they're apparently saying this to themselves or like whispering it to each other, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. There's the typical, you know, ad hominem attack, the, the, the smearing attack that we get in politics. Well, it's happening to Jesus. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. That's a basic principle. We need to remember that in the church. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons? I don't think this means followers of the Pharisees, because they're not doing this. I think this means they're juniors, which are Jesus' disciples who've been casting out demons. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And we know in Revelation that we're going to judge in, under apostolic authority Israel, under the apostles. Now, here we come to this incredible verse. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's on. Game on. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Isaiah 49, 25, it's happening. Proto Evangelium, it's happening. And here's your choice. You gotta decide. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. 
that is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, when Julius Gaius Caesar stood at the Rubicon River in northern Italy, and according to Suetonius in, on January 10th, um, 49 BC, in other words, about 45 years before Jesus is born, about 75 years before Jesus stepped into the Jordan River, catch the connection, Caesar, with the 13th Legion, the most powerful fighting force in the world, he's taken all of Gaul, he's killed a whole lot of people, he's taken parts of Germany. I mean, this is Julius Caesar now. But he's, there he is at the Rubicon. He has received orders that he's supposed to hand over his generalship. He's no longer going to have the most powerful army in the world at his beck and call. And he's going to be tried for various political offenses. What's he going to do? Is he going to surrender and submit to be attacked by his political enemies and taken out? Or is he going to fight? Well, Caesar, you know, when he prepares to cross the Rubicon, famously says to go into Roman Republic territory now, Elia Iacta Est. The die is cast. Game on. And what he does, of course, is leads to a civil war that's actually a, a world war. He eventually beats everybody, including his former colleague Pompey. He controls all of what Rome controls, and he sets up a dictatorship. But of course, his best friend betrays him, and he's killed in the Roman Senate after a few years of power. But what he has done in setting off this game on thing and stepping into the river is ultimately it leads to, through his adoptive son, Octavian, who becomes known as Caesar Augustus, a new, an entirely new kingdom that dominates the world. It's called the Roman Empire, okay? Luke is totally aware of that. That is not only the headline news of the last century when Luke is writing his gospel. It is by many historians considered the most significant thing in ancient history that happens, even bigger deal than Alexander the Great. Now, you gotta understand, when Luke's writing, and when Theophilus and other Greco-Roman people are reading this, they're thinking about that when they're thinking about Jesus and what Jesus is doing, okay? Rubicon, Jordan, beginning a new kingdom, beginning a kingdom that will never end. So that's what we're talking about with Jesus' mission. When did God the Father and the Spirit say game on? Just read Luke chapters 1 through 4. I mean, the incredible conception in a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit of the Messiah who's coming. All the way through what the angels sing when Jesus is born. All the way through when Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River when Jesus steps into his river, right, to say game on. And then catch this, the Holy Spirit baptizes Jesus and drives Jesus where? Out into conflict with the devil in the desert, right? Father says, this is my beloved son, it's on. Spirit says it's on. And Jesus then says it on. Here are some of them. Jesus comes to the Jordan River for baptism. He's baptized in the spirit. He defeats the devil in the desert round one of, it, of the battle. Secondly, Jesus says, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. I'm here to free the captives. Third, Jesus then routes demons, frees captives, and preaches the gospel of the kingdom for anybody who's willing to believe and be saved. Fourth, Jesus empowers his disciples to defeat demons. And when they come back and say, even the demons submit to us, Jesus says, I saw Satan falling from heaven. Luke 10, 18. Jesus teaches his disciples, here's us, to pray for what? The kingdom to come. We're supposed to be in on this and to pray for the Holy Spirit, to believe in Jesus and be empowered by him. Then Jesus continues his campaign against Satan's house and declares the kingdom of God has arrived. And in response to all the objections of the smear tactics and the uncommitted, the skeptics, says we got to choose sides. Here's what Jesus says in 11, 20 through 23. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come on you. Now that's special language. When Jesus says the finger of God, 
He's going all the way back to the Exodus story, and you get the finger of God twice, only twice in the Old Testament. When Pharaoh's magicians are trying to oppose Moses, when you get to the third plague, they can't match Moses with the gnats or the flies. And do you remember what happens? They say, this is Exodus 8, verse 19, they say, we can't match this to Pharaoh. This is the very finger of God. There's one other time when you get the finger of God in the Old Testament. It's in the same story. There's one part of the scripture that God himself writes with his own finger. What is that? The Ten Commandments. Y'all remember this? Exodus tells us this. Deuteronomy tells us this. So when Jesus says, I'm doing this by the finger of God, he's saying, I have the, I'm God himself. I'm here. I have the power to deliver my people and overcome the forces of darkness, and I have the power to reveal and write myself the very word of God because I am the word of God. That's what he just said. For today, let me just go to this. What does this mean for us? I mean, it's bad news for the devil, I have to tell you that. It's bad news for skeptics who say, I'm not sure or show me something better, Jesus. It's bad news for the uncommitted. Some of us in our own families, extended families, maybe have uncommitted. Well, I'm kind of in with Jesus, but I really don't have a lot of time for him. Jesus is like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's on. It is on one way or another. We are down to the wire. So if you have loved ones who are not committed to Christ right now and to what is happening about the kingdom coming, I want to encourage you to pray for them today. Because game is on, and the question is, which side are they on? Jesus says, we'll come back to this next week, there is no neutrality. In our households, in our parenting, in the way we work in the world, in our priorities, it is either you are in or out, according to Jesus. There is no neutral ground. You're either ultimately with the snake or the savior. I mean, that, that's Jesus, that's not Martin you know, getting excited about this. I'm telling you, that's what Jesus is saying. So as we move into next week, and we're going to look at this further, I want to invite you to be examining your priorities, your finances, your time, your, and most of all, your hearts with your own life, with your family, and with your children. We just commissioned teachers for our children and for our adults today, may they be committed and may we be committed to gathering with the Savior because he has come all the way down and he has given his life that we might have life in him. Come with him. Be in with him because it is game on. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.